I'll tell you the problem with the scientific power that you're, that you're using here. Uh, it didn't require any discipline to attain it. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Talking Smack, where we talk superheroes, movies, animation, comics, and much, much more. I'm your host, Josh Scar, and joining me, as always, is our favorite bald tabaxi man, Alex. Alex, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic, and Josh, I gotta bring this across to you right now. This is episode 150. It's around this 151. time. 151. Sorry, you're right, 151. And it's about this time in a podcast life that we need to pivot a little. A little bit of a rebrand to keep from being, getting still. So if you would switch that button right there, I'm going to show you our new intro, how we're leading into this week. Okay, this this new button here that says mm-hmm. Hollywood Foreplay. Let's see what this is all about. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to Hollywood Foreplay. As you know, we are the leading weekly talk show simulcast on ESPN, ABC, BBC One, and Patagonia 3 about Hollywood true. and golf. And leading it off, we have some golf scores for you. There's something about a negative three and a bird. I'm, I'm all in on birds. What do you think, Josh? Think, think, do we, think we have a market here? No. But, but get it four play? Four? No? Okay. Right. We're also joined by someone who I think it, I, you might be getting replaced by because that was just bad. Um, we are joined by the wonderful Justin Henson from the movie wire and between no back to the balcony. I don't, my, you guys cannot put that number two in there. It throws my brain off. Justin, how are you doing? <laughs> It's good. It's a good thing you said my name because I almost left the room after Alex's joke there. So I mean, got me at the right moment. I was all in for the jazz. Like the bass line was going is pretty good. But then yeah. like I was waiting for like uh Janet from the office to start singing, or uh, the Rocketeer would be more appropriate, I think, in this situation, given our all of our love for that movie. But then there was nothing, and then Alex decided to go off about golf. And yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> It was a great crescendo that just kind of fell off the cliff, Alex. I, I love you, but, you know, it, it, A for it, you know? it was a very high setup. I was like, okay, I, I can dig this. This is nice. And then you you just were like, we're pivoting. And all my brain went to was Chandler Bing going, pivot. Or no, it you know was what? Ross. Ross idea, pivot. Idea for the post-production of the show. Do the joke first and then the intro second. That way you kind of kind of lead to something great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well. How are you guys doing? Because I am doing fantastic after having to no longer edit the SmackDowns episode. That was a pain in the ass. And I hope people can appreciate what I put into that, even though they will never hear the unedited version, except for a handful of people. That was that was some stress and some work. I will pat myself on the back with that one. Actually, Alex put a new thing in here. Let's see what this is. Yes. Okay. I will take that as a pat on the back. <laughs> it, it's labeled. That one was labeled golf clap. I have another one on there. If you want to click the one that says putt hole. It says mm-hmm. puff hole. I know I typed it, but if you want to click that one. Yeah. <laughs> golf. <laughs> I don't know why you think talking smack needs to pivot into golf talk, but that's not happening. <laughs> I've been golfing once in my life and that was enough. Damn it. I had to lean in a little bit because I, I didn't hear the putt hole and I was worried about this sound effect. <laughs> I was more worried about the puff hole. <laughs> I've been worried about that ever since I saw it on the soundboard. Um, but <laughs> we're here this week to talk about some, talk about what's been going on in the box office and kind of pontificate on the causes of it and trying to see where maybe read the tea leaves and see where maybe things are going. But before we do that, We're going to hear from our friends Josh and Amanda over at the Super Familiar with the Wilsons podcast, and we'll be right back. The Super Familiar with the Wilsons podcast. You know that family whose house you hung out in when you were a kid? The house was a little loud and chaotic, but always fun, and sometimes felt more home than home. Well, that's us. We're the Wilsons, and we welcome you into our podcast with silly chat, ridiculous games, and interviews with interesting people. Like a spin doctor. The Super Familiar with the Wilsons podcast. Welcome home. 
I wish I was better at improving and riffing because I would have come back with a yeah if you want I, I don't know where I'd go from there but <laughs> every time I hear that promo and they talk about they they've talked to a spin doctor which I am admittedly jealous of as a child of the 90s I just I hear it and I specifically I remember the one where the lead singer got to go on Sesame Street and have a whole thing about sharing with Elmo while singing mm. a parody of Two Princes Oh, there's some kind of core memory that's trying to emerge and something else trying to shove it down. Oh, I don't, I don't know. Maybe what's it wasn't on. Elmo. I know it was like one of the it was one of the other it was one of the lesser known monsters because they were like trying to share and everything. But it, that's not important. We're not talking about that right now. We're here to talk about Hollywood, Hollywood executives, the box office and streaming. Not in that order particularly, but those are all the things that are big problems in Hollywood right now. So, Alex, this is something that I think is more in your wheelhouse. I'm going to let you take the reins on this one. The box office for the last four leading into five years now has obviously not been in a great place. We had a banner over 2019 where you had the release of Endgame and things just kind of kept going. Endgame had it had its reign as the largest movie of all time, not adjusted for inflation. It was a culmination of about 15 years, well, 12, 15 years of movie making, $2.8 billion at the box office on its own. You, we were people having discussions about the foreign box office because more and more it was looking like Hollywood was only getting maybe – Hollywood traditionally as in North America was, about, was going from 70 to 80% of the box office throughout most of its career into the 90s to about 25 to 30%. And – where movies were going, who were they maybe marketed for? What were they being? What were? What was America's place in the environment when you had uh, the rise of Bollywood and India's box office? China's box office was coming in strong, and then all of a sudden, COVID happened, <laughs> and basically for about a year, nothing was really released in theaters that "quote unquote" mattered. In terms of the large movies, you had some smaller movies. You had um, Tenet, which is is a big movie. You, have, you know that's uh, Christopher Nolan, budget of one hundred and fifty million to two hundred million. You had it released late twenty twenty one when people were trying to kind of like walk back, like what does the box office look like? Can we get people in? You had James Bond being held at the end of Daniel Craig's, and these movies did make some money. Uh, oddly enough, with no time to die it made about as much as was expected from a james bond movie somewhere between six to eight hundred million it wasn't going to get back to uh, to skyfall which was like a billion dollar movie especially when you had specter release after which i don't i i will never understand how skyfall made that much money i don't yeah. think it's that i don't i it does not feel like a billion dollar movie that final act i Take away my nerd card. Say I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a huge James Bond fan. Right. I think that movie is a lot of fun until mm -hmm. you get to the house, and then that finale is just boring, in my opinion. It's just too dark. It's. It doesn't feel like James Bond, and that's not the point of any of this. Yeah, but I kind of feel the same way. Just to insert is to me, I think that Daniel Craig is a target audience, and I won't. I could never understand. Uh, the amount of money any of them really make to justify the result, to be honest, just to throw that in there. So to me, it's not a multi-billion dollar uh, uh, Daniel Craig franchise. But that, I, I, I do feel like that leads into a little bit of this discussion where what was it about Skyfall? What was it about some of these franchises that five, six, seven, I think in Skyfall's case, it's probably more like 10 or 12 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, which is insane. It feels insane to say that it was that long ago. But what happened between that time frame and now besides the pandemic, because as much as the pandemic is indicative of the problems at the box office, I'm looking at the annual numbers right here, going back to 2005 since 2009 until the pandemic, the box office brought in over $10 billion uh, in total gross. Then the pandemic hit and then it plummeted to 2 billion. Mm -hmm. But it's it's slowly getting back up there. Uh, so in 2020 is two billion, 2021 four billion, 2022 seven point three billion, and then last year, largely on the back of Barbie and Oppenheimer, it was eight point nine billion. Yeah. And this year, right now, we're at two point seven billion, which I'm not sure where that is in terms of total 
project projections because especially with what we have going on this year but that's part of the discussion i think we need to have is what is it about movies back then compared to now right so that was late 2021 the box office seemed to be getting back on its feet a bit especially when you had spider-man no way home now spider-man no way home unexpectedly 1.5 billion in the middle of the pandemic especially when like the week before it, they had released Wonder Woman 1984, and that did nothing. Now, there was a little bit of like release, you know, the simultaneous there HBO was day and date release, release stuff yeah. going on with that. But you can't claim $600 million disappearing from its box office was just that when you have Spider Man there. Then we had, I know, Josh, prepare it. I know you, we had Tom Cruise in 2022 saving the box office. Allegedly. Right. Top Gun Maverick. A Lego cool that's like 34 years later, something like that. And it made 1.4 billion, eight, almost 800 million US, which, which when it actually, when adjusting for inflation, that movie was bigger now than the original one was, which is incredible to think about. You had hit movies throughout 2022. You, you know, um, Dr. Strange was in there. Which did well. It did better than its uh, did better than its original movie. Then we come into 2023, and there's some groans. There's some weirdness happening in the box office. You have a bunch of superhero movies underperforming. You have Quantum Mania. You have Blue Beetle. Uh, you have The Flash, but you also have, and we'll touch on this in a little bit. You have the strike starting. First, it was the writers' strike going on, but they could still film. The directors did not go on strike. They struck a deal. And then, at one, then simultaneously, which had happened for about 50 years, I think, you had the writers and actors, two unions on strike at the same time. And that was late July into late October. But during that time frame, you had a bit of an underperforming Mission Impossible, only made around $600 million. They thought it'd make more like nine, based off of the previous movies, seemed to be always increasing a little bit. But then you had Barbenheimer. Nobody projected that Barbie would earn 1.5, I think was its final. No, 1.2, I believe, was its final total. I believe Bar- Our Oppenheimer was somewhere around 1.4. Uh, Barbie was 1.4, 1.445. One of them was slightly under the other. It was 974. It was basically 975, bit, 975 million. Okay, so all right, my numbers were off on that, but Oppenheimer was huge in the U.S. Not as big as Barbie, though, but... Oppenheimer fell in roughly with where we expect a Christopher Nolan movie to film. He, I don't think he's crossed a billion outside of the Batman movies. I, domestically, I agree with that. That's that's around kind of around where he yeah. on a good movie. That's where he usually ends up. Yeah, um, you can bank on that. His, his more artistic stuff. He he's usually pretty good for three hundred to four hundred million globally. Yeah, and for an R-rated movie that I have my own feelings about in, in terms of representation of women and other stuff, that's its own thing. But as we crested into this year, this past four months has been really bizarre. July, I mean, January is always going to be what it is. January is a dump dump month. You're looking at low weekend totals between 50 to 75 million, if that. You might have one little movie like uh, Mathrigan Pop. But when you start approaching March, that's where Hollywood has pushed back the summer box office. Marvel likes it, that time frame as well. Summer late March for their first movie. Then you get the summer movie in May. We have Argyle, $200 million movie, open to 17. They thought it'd maybe do 45 to 50. You have Ghostbusters, The Frozen Empire. They were thinking after the success of that pandemic run, that that movie would pop somewhere between 50 to 60 million US. They didn't put a whole lot of money in it. It's a $100 million movie, but that movie made 45. And you expect, and this is what Hollywood banks on, is that the opening weekend, they will finish, if it's a well reviewed movie, somewhere between 3X to 4X in its total run. So they were thinking 45 million, this movie's gonna make 200 ish. It's barely crawled to 110. You had Abigail, which they were hoping for that Mithrigan thing. Didn't really work. $9 million opening, especially when they spent $30 million on it. They did not take the Blumhouse approach of doing like a $10 million movie. You had Fall Guy, If, and Furiosa. This is my, I will say, trilogy of what is going on here. Fall Guy, $150 million movie. Apparently a reboot of a franchise I barely remember from the 80s. Open to 35, they predicted around 50 to 60. If... 
I, I love Jim from The Office. I'm excited about The Quiet Place, but that's a hundred and ten million dollar movie that is crawling, trying to get to a hundred after it's been out for about a month now. And then you have Furiosa, a hundred and seventy million dollar mo- movie, projected fifty, open to thirty, and is not crawling to a hundred. It has been basically abandoned at the box office. So that is where things are right now. Is and we have another strike looming. The uh, IATSE, the tradesmen, workers, tradespeople, workers, unions, and stuff like that. The people who are, you know, the people who build the sets, all that stuff. They're looking to go on strike this year. They just had their contract expire on Wednesday. They're not looking to extend. They like another month leave. They're hoping to get talks done in the next week or so. But it looks like they're they're ready for their piece of the pie too. So we have this amalgamation of COVID, double strike, maybe another strike coming up, streaming, dumping everything streaming. So that's where I wanted to first ask you guys. We are seeing box office numbers, total weekend box office numbers in the U.S. that you would normally see off of Broadway. <laughs> and this is our this is our, our weekends. Um, when uh, when I, and Fall Guy came out, I'm oh, sorry, when Furious came out, it was the lowest weekend total for 40 years. Which that even that is a misrepresentation of things because saying that, Oh, this is the worst box office since return of the Jedi came out is that that's not a fair assessment because that 38 million, 33 million that return of the Jedi made at the time was really good. Oh yes. And so like saying that in and of itself is kind of indicative of what's going on here because uh, to kind of just start not to not bear the lead on my thoughts, I feel like a lot of this comes down to marketing. Executives, studios aren't afraid of marketing anything original. They don't want to present anything that doesn't feel comfortable to people. Like whenever we see a trailer, we immediately go, oh, okay, this is the new Borderlands trailer. Oh, it's Guardians of the Galaxy again. They're just yep. doing it in a video game movie with a much older cast. Like there's no one under the age of 55 in that movie besides young Gamora. And if the way that John Krasinski and Ryan Reynolds talked about, if they said it was going to be a live action Pixar movie. And yet the only thing we ever see from that movie is that, Oh, it's a slapstick family comedy. They never present it as it is. And like, part of that is, yeah, you don't want to give away spoilers, but they do that anyway. You just don't get the full context of what the heart of the movie is. So I love that you brought up the marketing piece of it because the fall guy is going to be my new prime example of how theaters are look, being looked at right now, because fall guy, the theatrical experience of that was the marketing because that hits streaming two weeks later. And that's being generous. If we look, and I had this conversation with Antonio over the cult worthy a couple weeks ago. If we look to where the early two thousands prior were, you would walk into a theater, you would have, different genres you would have a very diverse pick of movies that you can pick from from comedy to drama to horror you can pick in pick your emotion and you can walk into that movie as the 2000s go on and we can blame the pandemic and don't get me wrong that was that was the hammerhead that was the nail in the coffin but we've seen this evolution going the wrong way with theaters where we take away from the experience where we get assigned seating. And this is where it hurts with the marketing on the assigned seating. I absolutely love it because I hate sitting next to people. But at the same time, for a lot of people with that experience, they're not picking seats. We would show up 30 minutes before a movie being forced to do that, um, to being forced to watching these trailers, to seeing what's coming out, um, to get those good seats. So we're taking a little bit of that away um, from that. The assigned seating is for the consumer. The intent is there, but it's taking away from the marketing. And there's a reason why there's 13 minutes of commercials going into that to kind of tap into that missed audience to gain some extra cash and to ensure that the previews are coming on that we can see. But me, I will schedule my time exactly nine minutes to get to that theater to avoid commercials. Um, and sometimes I miss that first trailer. So right now, what's ev- becoming the evolution of marketing is exactly, and I think the fall guy is going to be that turning point in the road um, because this one, that one is the worst one I've seen go from theater to streaming so quickly. That one is a big budget movie. They had some high hopes for it. That one, what a 
great marketing uh, piece of it to put in the theaters for 13 days and then it gets hit to streaming. It's scary to a point on the example of what's going to happen with movies coming forward. But at the same time, it's a smart marketing move to an extent with VOD spiking up in uh, numbers and studios getting that in their pocket. I think that's a really good counterpoint to it as well, because streaming is the other side of the, the marketing coin, because now all these studios have their hand in the jar of streaming and streaming is kind of like running a social media, a, a web, a social media website. You are just bleeding money and you're trying anything and everything you can to get and retain subscribers. And the only way you do that is with an influx of content. So by taking the idea of this movie is exclusively in theaters, like they will, they, since the pandemic quote unquote ended, they will probably say this is only coming to only coming to theaters. You will not get it anywhere else. Not for any time soon, because remember theaters are an exclusive window and out of nowhere, seemingly with, with the fall guy kind of being the harbinger of this. Now it's like, exclusively in theaters for five days, 10 days. How long are you willing to sit in the theater for this? Cause then we'll immediately put it on streaming so you can watch it. And I don't know if that's executives and studios catering to their streamers and the audience that didn't show up to the theater. But if the theater experience is going to survive the box, the studios and the executives need to understand that they need to create they need to do what nintendo kind of did with the wii they need to create demand by not sending it out to streaming immediately afterwards because like just because it didn't open well does not mean it doesn't have legs like elemental is a perfect example of this it it almost made 500 million dollars globally it didn't make as much in the u.s but i think that's because not enough people were talking about it and back to the previous point of marketing it just looked like another inside out sideshow like oh it was a concept that we, we they kind of discarded from inside out and everyone just like oh okay yeah inside out whatever but it, it was so much more justin you and i did a bonus episode on it is it is an amazing movie or no i did elemental on my own you and i did wish but either way like i saw elemental i wasn't excited for it, it but my kids wanted to go see it so i was like okay let's i love going to the movies i'll sit through uh maybe hopefully a, a mediocre kids movie. And it was really good. It was, it was like just shy of a Pixar classic. And I think that's only because I, the solution to the problem was a little too simple, I think, or maybe too complicated. I don't quite remember. I haven't seen it since theaters, but it was, it was that close. Like people love brave. Brave is brave is good. I don't want to say it's bad. It's, it's good. It, but it's, above average it's not a pixar classic the only reason it's a pixar uh, a pixar classic is because merida the character of merida is is what makes that movie people tend to forget about how convoluted and stupid she is in the movie but overall the the picture the movie that is brave is fine i think elemental is right on that same level it tells a great story and it tells a heartwarming story but people just, the marketing didn't convey that. They were too busy being like, oh, it's a Romeo and Juliet thing. Oh, it's it looks like something from inside out. It looks like Zootopia. It looks like just too much of a mess of things to understand what it's actually about. I didn't see Elemental because in theaters because there was just timing going around. The timing didn't really suit me to actually want to go. And my normal group I, I go with, they didn't think it looked interesting. They're like, oh, it's fire and water. Yeah, okay. That's really obvious what this is gonna, all going to be about. And it basically died off in the U.S., but it did all right worldwide. But it has done well with done well on streaming. But that's actually something I wanted to. One of the things I wanted to discuss with you guys is. So, a few weeks back, Rebel Moon Part Two came out, and Zack Snyder famously said, (laughs) "It it yeah, we'll see about those numbers eventually." But he did make a very strong point that I found fascinating. More people saw Rebel Moon than saw Barbie. Allegedly. Well, if you, you, yeah, because Pixar will, I mean, not Pixar, uh, Netflix will never officially release numbers. 
but he threw out some numbers and you look at you know you price per ticket how many tickets were actually sold then you look at how many people allegedly watched watch this but that doesn't mean it has the same had the same cultural relevance talking about rebel moon for two weeks two three weeks and then it kind of goes away until the next one comes out versus those long legs that the Barbie Oppenheimer had where people were talking about it, looking at the numbers and things were going on for about six weeks before everything really settled out there. More people may have very well. How we, we don't know two X as many people may have seen rubber moon. You can't tell me it had the same cultural relevance of a movie in theaters and people getting off their couch to go to a movie theater to experience that nine minute drive Justin has to do with the 15 fucking minutes of trailers. <laughs> if you're lucky, 15 minutes. Yeah. $30 popcorn with some asshole sitting next to you that you don't like to watch trailers to then do this. And I have to drive home and, and gnaw on it, you know, let it linger in your mind. There's something about the theater experience where you can't turn it off to go get more water or to, you know, go use the bathroom. You sit there. It, it's an investment. Yes. Well, and here's the thing, too. You can count Rebel Moon for me for five viewings because I attempted five times to get through it, and I couldn't. So let's count those numbers of how many people tried to (laughs) attempt to watch this movie. So so those numbers, given how they define those numbers, I would be curious because I'm sure it's accurate. If you flip it on, fall asleep to it, or flip it on for five minutes, turn it off, that's probably counted as a view. So I'm very skeptical of streaming numbers on what looks good to the public and to investors. So I don't buy what they present to the public at all when it comes to that, because they are competing for time on streaming. They are promoting future movies. They are under contract with some of these studios. They want these numbers to look good. They want people to say, based on this number, watch my movie. And I think it's complete and utter bullshit. But here's the deal with the experience. And I love the fact that you talk about the experience because here's the deal. You're hundred percent right because the theater can't die. And I don't think studios will allow it to die because you allow theaters to die right now. You're gonna eliminate the creativity of the youth that have that awe factor. You cannot tell me one person that sits there butt on a couch that's part of our youth that looks on the 55-inch screen, 65-inch screen, TV audio, and say, that's what I want to do. Because you're going to get in this de-evolution of creators and filmmakers. I would be more concerned, rather than the theaters going down, than creativity going down. Because it all starts with the experience. Every piece of talent in Hollywood that didn't go to the corrupt side, started with being wowed in the theater. So if we want to start with how we're going to save the theater to save creativity, you have to start with the theater experience. And honestly, being shoved a bunch of commercials, I get why, because they're struggling financially. But at the same time, they need to find a different way. Because watching four soda commercials before a movie does not spark creativity. So the theaters, I can walk into a theater, and I've said this pet peeve in numerous since I only go to the theater four to five times a week. So I'm an amateur at this point, I suppose. But you walk into a theater... 99% of the time, your usher is reading a book. 99% of the time, they're looking down on their phone. There is no engagement from these theaters because there is no care because they're used to just five people walking into a single movie if you're lucky. So that's where theaters need to start is building that experience back, not making it more convenient with picking your seats or not uh, just putting a standee up in the corner and calling it good. So to me, that's where it starts. Man, you just triggered one of the biggest depression moments for me every time i go to our big local theater in rockford um she'll play 16 that theater has two wings plus the main lobby the main lobby is where the the big concession stand is and then each wing has its own like mini concession stand those mini concession stands were open for the first like 10 15 years that theater was open it's over it's almost 30 years old now and then for the last 15 years both wing concessions have been just completely shut off and they've basically just become glorified display cases that just have weird fast food looking shelving in the background. They don't even bother to like tarp it off or anything. And every time I go beyond theaters, one, two or three and nine, 10 and 11, it just makes me sad thinking about how many times I went to that theater and it was just every concession line was packed because everyone was so excited to be at the theater. And now 
you have three people like it's great being a consumer and wanting to go get concessions because I can, I can literally just walk up to the counter and hit people are like, yeah, okay. Yeah. The popcorn's 10 hours old because no one's been here all day, but you know, at least it's something, but it's, it is, I, I don't know if it's just because obviously prices are a little crazy because the biggest profit for a movie theater is the concessions that's why you pay six dollars for red vines that's why you pay ten dollars for a bucket of popcorn if you're lucky like alex and i are because i know there are some people who have to pay 20 25 dollars for a midday ticket we have to pay 12 dollars for a midday ticket and then i think our evening shows are like 14 15 dollars unless it's imax then it goes up to like 18 but again we are fortunate because we aren't paying $25, $30 for an IMAX show. I, I, I legit rented a theater to see the James Bond movie, No Time to Die, because it was late 2021. Things weren't really settled. I rent a theater for myself and I think nine friends showed up and we all spaced out. It was a great experience. No trailers. But we walked in and... They still haven't done this the last time I was in there, and this bothers the crap out of me. The little marquee sign above each door used to have the movie and showtime that it was playing. That has been off since COVID. Well, they don't want people... I, I understand that because they don't want people sneaking into the shows anymore. I honestly think it's... I literally think it's because that that costs them like $4 a month per theater, that little sign, to, to actually be on. I, That's what I, I think. That too. <laughs> but that's not on... Does 14 have the signs on? I don't think the 14 has the signs on either. They don't. Neither of them do. Well, and we're getting into the point, too, because you mentioned the sneaking in. They, theaters don't even care if you sneak into movies or not anymore. So it's just free for all. Spend the entire day there. But when it comes to the little things, I mean, you mentioned the sign, but it is those little things that matter of, you know, walking through and just seeing the artwork back. I know taking me back, looking at the artwork of the marquees, the little ones. I thought that was exciting current posters that sometimes in the theater I go to, they still have a poster from three months ago up that they haven't changed. So there are little things that theaters can do, but it's that extra effort um, to make that happen. Um, and I'll go down memory lane. When I was managing a theater back when the Grinch came out, it was the little things of decorating the uh, theater, taking the employees, giving them initiative to really take on building toys, suckers, whatever it may be. Um, to build that experience to it, partnering with Toys R Us at the time to bring in a guy dressed as Grinch. There are things these theaters can do that's right in front of their face, but it's the thing where we don't want to put in the investment to it because they're not making enough. So a theater chain has to make that jump to make it happen. And it can't just be on a small scale where nobody talks about it. it can't be the one to two theaters doing it nationwide. AMC, Regal especially, they need to grow a pair and actually invest some money into the experience, not the advertising and not the promotional of products because it's again like i just said it's going to start with the kids on it or else that's where streaming's really going to focus on the parents or the home life to build that experience for their kids and i wouldn't bet on money for that to grow that uh creativity when it comes to future filmmakers so a question for the two of you 42 <laughs> very close i don't i don't i don't have kids both of you do younger children um as in children under the age of reason Allegedly. so 25 <laughs> are you instilling that love for the movie theater to your kids because i love the theater I, that's why i was so excited a few months ago when i found out about the classic cinema in beloit we, it, there's only about eight or nine screens but we opened the door and it is you could tell it was an old dollar theater that was just off the mall that they revamped because i went there once like 16 years ago with a friend and it was a dollar theater. We it was like Tuesday. We paid a buck fifty to see I think Halloween and uh, two or Halloween Kills, whatever the hell the the crappy ones were from the mid odds. But they they bought it. It was completely refurbished. Had the leather seats, the heated recliners, all that stuff. But it opened the door and just to smell of fresh butter popcorn. And they have popcorn and soda. That's really all they have. And yes, you have the little rack of all the expensive candies and stuff like that. But it was just that wafting smell. And they were all dressed in, you know, in their little outfits and stuff like that. We, cho we had chosen our seats ahead of time. It, it, there it was only about 10 minutes of trailers. They the actual the ticket tells you when the movie starts and when the credits start. And it was such a great experience. 
I was like, oh yeah. So that's when we went the next week to go see again, you know, the movie there. But for me, the the going to a movie is about the shared experience of delight and awe. And one of my best experiences in the past five years, other than seeing Godzilla Frozen X Kong Frozen Empire, was at the AMC sixteen seeing Quiet Place One. Silence. Freaking silent. The first few minutes people were opening their little bags of candy and ripping and stuff. But there was just dead silence other than jump stairs and ah and other stuff. It was the communal feeling of opening weekend of like 250 people in this theater who just knew to shut the hell up and we are seeing something special. I think what you're saying, I think that's part of what makes the Nicole Kidman promo so cringe. Yeah. Is because yeah, that's exactly why we come to the theater. Is we we come here to have this communal experience. We come here to be told this amazing story or a story that's going to make us feel something that we we will invest our time in. But that's like at the end of the movie, you you were explaining the plot to me. No, twas beauty that killed the beast. Like, <laughs> shut the fuck up. Well, I think too, because I think Regal had a better one, uh, kind of along the same, same messages. We're all the same when the lights go out. It's one of my favorite slogans from Regal, and they kept it very simple, and it didn't last as long as Nicole Kidman. Um, but I think also to answer kind of your question, Alex, is going back to the conversation piece of having that open dialogue. And I think that's a danger in social media now is that there's so much opinion, so many spoilers out to kind of ruin the experience of the movie too. So walking out of a theater and having a dialogue, especially with who you're with, especially if you have kids to find out what they took away from the movie to get that instinct of the experience. So it's reminding them of the experience. Cause I know with my daughter, she's been on my show a couple of times. She has a strong opinions about movies that we built, but it, it was a foundation of having that dialogue, taking her out of the movie, having the conversation. And then if it's a something she really was passionate about, you know, we treat her to a toy or a souvenir to really remind her of that movie and to continuously speak about it. So as much as we want to put it on the theater, and I just went on a rant to blame the theater, um, but at the same time, it's also building that experience on the parents' end, not just to walk out, get in the car, drive home, and forget about it later. And I can say that even for streaming to an extent as well, of uh, is having that important conversation with kids and even adults to some points because there's nothing I like better than to have just an open dialogue about a movie when it comes down to it. I'll talk all day long about uh, specific genres or movies and it's never a debate. It should be just an open conversation. Movies are the last great uh, debate and conversation that we have um, that doesn't lead to kind of an angry conversation it seems like in society today. So that's why to me it's very important to have that experience foundationally based on the dialogue. I, I find it really funny, Justin, that you talk about how movies are one of the last places where we we don't necessarily, when we're in polite company, when we're not on the internet, faceless and uh, anonymous on the internet, it's one of the places where we can have a good discussion about what we liked, what we didn't like about a movie and be civil about it. And I, I love that you brought that up because I literally had an, an example of this at my job this last week where uh, one of the new hires was talking about how she had seen madam webb and she liked it and <laughs> it was like i started going off about how it's a very it's a okay movie it's a disappointingly okay movie until you get to the end where it's just a ridiculous cw season finale that just completely throws everything and anything at the wall and she just kept talking about how she enjoyed it and she does she's like interested to see how they're setting up spider-man for this new ms madam web universe i'm like you're gonna be very disappointed but i got to a point where i was just like josh you're being a dick this person enjoyed something stop it and so i was i just i kind of just kept asking her questions about like what else did you enjoy about it what is it that made you enjoy it and i'm not really going to get into it but i it was one of those things where I I didn't want to be and I don't want to be the guy that's like, no, it's bad and you're stupid for thinking it's good. I wanted to just have that conversation. I wanted to be civil. I wanted to be like, you had a different experience than I did. Please indulge me and please show me what you saw in this movie that maybe I didn't. And she didn't see anything. I don't think that was unique. It's just that she's not invested in these movies like I am. She is very just surface level interested. She's happy to see 
pretty women in five seconds of superhero costumes. And it was just, it, it did, it, it never got hostile. And there was one other person who was like chiming in every now and then who was on my side, who was like, no, it was a piece of dog shit. What are you talking about? But I, I did try to like, I, I kept him at bay. Cause I'm like, no, you shut the fuck up because you're being a dick. I don't want to be a dick, but I need to, I need to get my point across to you. But then I realized my point doesn't matter. And I think that's a, a good transition point here because Rotten Tomatoes has affected, I think, a big part of the theater going experience as well, because people don't understand what that is. And I've shared a lot of examples of things that recently happened. And one of the things that came up in my Facebook memories recently was I bought Bambi on Blu-ray like seven years ago, eight years ago, and it had a Rotten Tomatoes sticker on it said certified fresh. And I, I had social, I had tweeted out the image saying, Hey Disney, I don't think you need to have the Rotten Tomatoes sticker on Bambi of all movies. But now like having that certified fresh sticker, that certified fresh moniker for a movie, even if it's a movie that got like two and a half out of four stars, that's technically a fresh rating. It, it signifies something to the general audience that they're like, Oh, this must be really great. And then they walk away like, Oh, it's fine. I don't know why it's 93% on Rotten Tomatoes, but okay. And that's my big rant about Rotten Tomatoes is the fact if we go back again, reminiscent, you look at your local paper and that's kind of the opinion you would stick to is something that you have ease of access to. And uh, the problem I have with Rotten Tomatoes is it's it reviews can to an extent affect the way a movie does drastically. No, but it does affect it. I mean, it is what it is, but Nobody goes in really, really to deep dive in a lot of these reviews. They'll human nature is we go towards the negative and we want to see why something's bad versus why something's good. And in most cases, we'll look at that, just that green splat or the, uh, the tomato and say, that's good enough. So I'm not going to see this, but um, spending that extra time or picking a critic and spending the research to really relate to that you can kind of trust, but not always agree with. Um, to gain that aspect. But the problem is, is we're not reading the positives from a movie um, more than we are the negatives. And that's kind of, we look at IMDb the same way as well when we go into reviews or we go into even user reviews. Even I have had the habit of scrolling down to the one stars for movies that I like to find out why didn't you like this movie? It's because it's just, that's something we're attracted to. And I know with a lot of my friends, we joke about it, because I'm the only one that hated the master of disguise and they go on a r big rant and argument on uh, why it's such the best, the best comedy of all time. And that's, I think the one movie that just drives me nuts. And I spent so much time to see why I'm wrong, why these guys are convincing me about why I'm wrong to read these reviews. And it made me feel better, but that doesn't justify a good movie. One of the things that bothers me about Rotten Tomatoes is it has become highly politicized in various manners it's no longer an independent uh, independent entity it's owned by comcast and you do see that they have made changes like when the star wars movies came out like the last jedi and people were unhappy about it there they started doing verified user reviews we, people can't just review it anymore no no you have to like verify it. i don't know what the whole process is but well, wasn't that more in re uh that was more of a response to captain marvel wasn't it because that was getting review bombed horribly. I'm pretty sure it was the last Jedi. Like, but you, you it, it could have right. been both. Like right. maybe the last Jedi started it, and then Captain Marvel was like the straw that broke the camel's back. But I feel like it was Captain Marvel that caused that. Yeah, but there was a heavy lean on them to start vetting their. You know, you can't just let anybody. Which is a problem when you started looking at, as you said, Josh, Captain Marvel or Black Panther, and their premieres were inviting fan were inviting Rotten Tomatoes critics, but also YouTube critics and stuff like that. And even I, 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 I before twenty twenty, I used to have, I, I went to the movies so much that I used to get the AMC alert of like, hey, there's an early showing of this movie coming out in a month. Would you come? And it was a free ticket. It was a free ticket. I've seen it early. And I am always more favorable to something that is free that I see before anyone else. Even if it was something terrible like um, the Guy Ritchie King Arthur movie. They gave us all little hats and posters for showing up. And we were like, the, it was like two weekends before it came out. It's King for a Day kind of thing. You can't tell me that Disney flying out people to go to 
the to go to the premiere to be put up in a hotel to sit with the cast are giving you me unbiased reviews. You can't. And then there has been some scandals that come out every six months or so. They find another batch of people that were being paid for early reviews and early access that were being paid for favorable stuff. So there is a bit of Rotten Tomatoes that is politicized, but also compromised. And I think one of the big ways you can see that is a a show came out uh, a year or two ago, Chris Pratt. Yes, I know people have opinions on him, but called The Terminal List. It was an Amazon TV series. It's their biggest series I've ever released. It still is their biggest series. It was number one on their platform for like a month. It hit a bunch of streaming numbers. But the Rotten Tomatoes critics' reviews are that it's a jingoistic, terrible, right-wing propaganda, piece of crap, pro-military show with like 38% on Rotten Tomatoes for critic score. The audience verified reviews are 95% positive. That is a disconnect that I think Hollywood has with trying to tell us what we should like in some aspects unless it's like if or something where you don't really need to be told what it is and as justin and josh we talked about a little bit um previously off off mic about civil war both sides try to claim victory for that movie (laughs) but also there was that feeling of because both sides are trying to claim victory but it had nothing to say what is it trying to say that it didn't quite nail the mark on that And that, to me, bothers me about Rotten Tomatoes, is if I'm going to go there to see what is happening, I have to go like, okay, if it's Star Wars Acolyte, what do the critics say? Okay, I have to discount about 70% of them because they're in Disney's pocket. But I also can't have to discount about 70% of the user reviews because they're just still upset that Luke isn't a badass and all that other crap. Okay, what is... I, I hate that the fundamental start of Rotten Tomatoes was it was just supposed to be yes or no, and now it very much is, okay, filter results, filter results, filter results. Screw it. I'll just wait for it to come to streaming. There is a movie uh, back in 2022. Um, and this is, I think this movie gained the rule of me not reading any reviews until I'm done. Because it was a, a Vengeance by B.J. Novak from The Office. So um, the review I just destroyed this movie um, about it being right-winged and they didn't like how they betrayed Texans because they didn't have enough guns. And everything in this review pinpoint a personal stereotype of uh, how people should look and not the movie. And as that review came out, others followed around the same motif. And after watching the movie, it irritated me that reviews were following stereotypes and inserted politics into art and this movie isn't about politics it isn't about the people's politics it's about it's a murder mystery that has subtle hints to or has a setting in texas and to review a movie based on your personal views that is something that's like almost the number one rule when it comes to criticism is to leave your personal opinions at the door and judge it for the substance you see on screen. Um, And that's to where Rotten Tomatoes really does follow a trend to an extent. I, I, all the reviews should come out at the same time because there is a pattern that I've seen prior that one will come out. One will follow the same tone. You have critics out there that do follow their normal critics to make sure that they're in line. It almost seems in unison. And that's why I try and steer away from reviews until everything, for me at least, is done. Because when you have 200 to 300 people reviewing it, you can't tell me, like you said, Alex, it's not, it can't all be accurate. And even if you take out the corrupt, you're also going to have the followers. You take out the followers, you're also going to have the ones that put their personal spin on it. And that's not what a movie critic should do. And that's not morally what they should do, period. You're right. Uh, Josh, can you hit that um, clapping button or something? Applause? Uh, it's for you. Uh, because. Captain Marvel was review bombed in 2019 and it was implemented first for Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. There we go. Yep. Gee, who owns two of the who owns both of those movies <laughs> and doesn't want them getting review bombed? But I, I think I think the politics side of it is also like no one wants to talk politics. Everyone's fucking tired of politics. But that has started to play a role in things because you have the people who are crying woke about everything. Like 
the acolyte right now is getting review bombed because the the scene where master soul is walking around in the jedi temple and teaching the younglings every human character is a female or non-white male and then everyone else is an alien and like oh no diversity god forbid but because some people are that sensitive to not being the person that is being labeled the hero they have to say it is the worst fucking thing ever and it's ridiculous that we give these people voices and power like they have over something that can influence others like the rotten tomatoes audience scores because there are some people now who just completely disregard the critics score because they believe that the critics are too woke they're bought they're corrupt whatever and they will trust the audience score so if the audience score is 36 percent on the acolyte they're not going to give it a shot a chance in hell and i think that's a disservice because if they enjoy star wars i think the acolyte is at least very good star wars right now uh through two episodes but we'll see what happens over the course of the next seven weeks or however many episodes this show is but that also plays a role in everything else because i i fully understand and i endorse the idea of diversifying and showcasing people of color and showcasing them in roles that maybe they normally wouldn't be the little mermaid is a perfect example it's a mermaid who gives a shit as long as that person is performing the role well i don't care what color skin they have because it's a mermaid that that should not matter as long as they can sing as long as they can say i'm 16 and i'm not a child and it's like bitch please <laughs> i wanted to touch on one more thing about audience stuff this because this actually made me really laugh i, I love doctor who uh, watching the new season and there's some stuff i'm kind of like okay you're not being very subtle with your messaging which is which kind of bothers me a little bit because I, I like subtlety i like things that make me think and i i will say one of the episodes that came out called dot and bubble hit me hard with the subtlety it was so there's two two points here i'll get to them but the end of the episode you found out that the show what it was an allegory for one social media and all this crap but there was a second point hidden underneath it about racism and it's something that just went completely over my head at first because i was watching a show that i'm aware of oh, i'm watching a show that is primarily made in wales in the uk and they tend to have a lot of white people and this is the first doctor of color um if first male doctor of color there's some timey-wimey stuff about there may have been a female doctor of color but anyway not important and it was done subtly that i didn't even understand it because they cast the extras, the entire show you're watching, they cast the extras to the expectation that you are seeing a show in the UK to make a point at the end, which was great. But then this previous episode of Doctor Who that just came out, spoilers alert, there is a, a same-sex kiss. Oh, oh, shocking. And a bunch of the media outlets are like, Doctor Who makes history with first same-sex kiss in its 60-year history. Uh, it got a lot of fan. Uh, it got uh, the tweet. The tw what is it? The X notes or fan notes or whatever. It's tweet. It's Twitter. Yeah, just it's Twitter. Yeah, the Twitter notes, because it's actually like the ninth kiss in Doctor Who history. <laughs> and I just found that funny. I was like, yeah, that was the first time that that. And I was like, no, no, Captain Jack was on the show, and Captain Jack was famously Omni everything. <laughs> And so there is a little bit of that whole the, oh, sorry, community notes, that's what it is, that the whole you're putting out a headline to ignore the fact that this has happened before when you're trying to claim it's new and racy kind of thing. Well, and that's going to be kind of the marketing thing. But I agree with Josh. I mean, at the end of the day, it's I don't deep dive into small stuff like that. Diversity should be in Hollywood, period. Yeah. And I don't really care. Um, tell me uh, just a story. That's what I want to see when I go to a movie. Who you cast, whether they do a great job or a poor job, it's not going to matter, male, female, black, white. I don't really care. Just tell me the story. Put who you think is going to be best in the role. And at the end of the day, let the audience decide. Um, I'm the same way with reboots and remakes, too. I don't care. Show me them. Um, will they be better than the original? 99% of the time, no. But I don't mind seeing a creative vision of something else. Hollywood can do whatever they want when it comes to telling a story, but just keep it simplistic and just tell the story. That's things get so complicated when we put art 
into the mix. And that's where we've seen video games, we've seen books, we've seen music. All of that is meddled with and it becomes overly complicated. And when you get overly complicated with views, that's when more money gets poured into this stuff and it makes it even more complicated. So at the end of the day, walk into a movie and just watch the awe of the story. I think that's a great point because you can't tell me that the, a quiet place would not be just as good. Like you have John Krasinski in the chair, you have that same story, but let's put Michael B. Jordan in the John Krasinski role. You can't tell me that movie still isn't amazing. hundred percent. Just because the lead actor is now a black man. Like that, that does not change anything in that story other than maybe a racist perception of that story because, Oh no, a white man is the father of a bunch of kids. Oh no. <laughs> like God forbid. But that, that does also lead uh, into a pretty good transition, not what I just said, but what Justin said, a pretty good transition into one. I think maybe this should be the last thing we talk about. And uh, I'm going to plug our friends. I have some notes uh, for this talking point is um, during their most recent episode where they talked about Star Trek Nemesis. They went off on a little tangent early on in the episode where they were talking about how new Star Trek feels just a little off like it's not as interested or at least not everything that's not strange new worlds uh feels more interested in the pew pews and the the big battles and that's because it's written by people who grew up with star trek it's not written by people with stories to tell and so it's sort of like the simpsons where you have like 10 years of the simpsons where it's just written by great comedy writers and then all of a sudden you get to season 11 and onward and now it's written by people who grew up on The Simpsons and it's staffed with people who grew up on these things. And so now we have Twisters. We have a movie based on a 1990s property, just an event, natural disaster movie that did not need a sequel, doesn't need a sequel, doesn't need a spinoff, really doesn't need a, a reboot. But because everything needs to be an existing IP, let's reboot it or sequel it. I don't, it, it, we, do we still even know what this is? Is it a sequel? Is it a reboot? Is it some kind of, I don't know. Glenn Powell's in it. I don't care. <laughs> I take my last statement back. <laughs> but either way, like it, it was written by someone who had seen Twister and they were like, I can do something similar. I can do something more. Or maybe someone just said, we want to do it's pitch meeting where they said, you got that new twister movie for me. And th they just made a twisters, uh, a twister sequel. And they're like, Oh yeah, it's going to be just like aliens to alien. Um, but you, you know, like, but I, I thought that was a really interesting point where we're not, at least in the writer's room, I don't think we're devoid of creativity. I think executives are creatively bankrupt. They're more interested in getting dividends for their stockholders than yeah. they are creating good stories that will get them returns in the box office because we're so late stage capitalism right now that they're, they're able to manipulate their stock numbers without increasing any kind of output and they can get insurance coverages because they can do the producer's loophole and all these other things. Like the thing that I think needs to be done to get people back in the theater is one, you need to create a sense of scarcity because you can't just drop shit on streaming 14 days after it's supposed to be in theaters, a theater run used to a theatrical run used to be anywhere from 30 to 90 days. I think Jurassic Park was one of the last movies that went longer, um, but Titanic and Avatar, like those movies lasted like six months. Top Gun, uh, Maverick. Top Gun Maverick also like Top Gun Maverick went for like two years. <laughs> Gross. But I, I still haven't seen Top Gun Maverick, but from everything I've heard, like it's, it's spectacular visually, but narratively, it's not anything extraordinary. But that's Avatar too. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's both Avatar movies. And like, uh, I was hoping we would kind of talk a little bit more about Pixar because we have a Pixar movie coming out next week. That's a sequel. And there's a whole bunch of stuff coming out from Disney where they're blaming catharsis stories from creatives as the reason why these movies failed, even though four of them released during the pandemic directly onto streaming. And yet they're, you're complaining about their box office return when they didn't have a box office. But again, that's getting into the corporate ghouls and the, the executives, but with the writing, there's still just, I know there's only so many stories you can tell in so many different unique ways. And that's part of where cinematography and directing come into it because they, they're the ones that have the vision for it. Like the, the writer has the story, 
but the director, the cinematographer, the rest, the rest of the team need to have the vision. And Justin, I'm going to call you out because one of the reviews that sticks in my head the most is how you talked about the visual style of Skin of Marink. It's a very unique visual storytelling device told with a very stupid and bad story and a bad director. But maybe it's the cinematographer that deserves more credit than the director. But there, we need to find, studios need to find that balance. And like A24, I think, is close. Like they're the, they're the best thing we have right now to finding that just completed Avengers team of a great production team. And I think that's kind of where movies need to go is because everything else just feels carbon copy right now. Like I mentioned the Borderlands movie coming out later this year, and it just looks like a Guardians of the Galaxy ripoff. I'm excited for Alien Romulus because it seems like they're going to be focusing very heavily on the facehuggers, which is something we don't see a whole lot of and things that don't get like people know what the facehuggers are, yeah. but they're always just like a quick jump scare. And then the next thing we see is them wrapped around someone's face. This seems like maybe instead of getting the little alien running around for a while, the facehuggers are going to be on the hunt. And I'm interested in that because that's something we haven't seen before from this franchise. One of the best scenes of alien of aliens is the facehugger scene where it is used as a weapon against Sigourney Weaver and Newt. And it is fascinating. And if you want to expand that out to an entire movie with alien Romulus, fantastic let's see if the entire happens. second act of that movie is just the face hugger and then the final act is the the alien part i'm all for it oh yeah you touched on some points that um that kind of bother me so i'm looking at the fall guy and argyle's budget 150 200 million dollars each and a lot of that was going to the front end you know the front end people being paid tens of millions of dollars for their time but you can't tell me the well, those two movies are built upon the premise that they're action flicks. There is nothing I saw in either of those trailers or the movies because for some reason I decided to watch Argyle with my wife while on while in the Mediterranean sailing from one port to another. John Wick, none of those movies have been have a budget of over ninety million dollars. They all look better because the people who are making them took the time and effort to learn their shtick, to learn, you know, to learn the choreography, to settle in and have the right people with the right production to take the appropriate salaries so that they could all benefit if the movie did well. And that is something that I hope that we get a little bit more out of because it has kind of, because of streaming, there has been a pivot in movie in budgets to front load all the budgets because they don't like to pay people on the back end because streaming is not profitable right now. And the recent strikes have gotten a little bit of a shakedown from the streaming. They have started adjusting some of those wages to actually give residuals. That's not great, but they're at least trying something, but there's a reason why, Again, to use Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise and Christopher Nolan Gross. have been able to make movies for so long. They take very little up front. They want a lot of back end because they believe in the product that they're selling. They're willing to take very little up front to get the right people, the right stunt choreographers, the right cameras, the right directors of photography, everybody in place to make something really good. And I would... I mean, I can't deny people. If someone offered me, you know, $20 million to do Argyle. And I'm like, I don't understand that. I don't understand what's going on here, but you know what? 20 million, 21, 20 million. I'm going to go build a lovely lake house. <laughs> I think they need to start caring a little bit more about the product that they're trying to get us to go see. And that includes the stars who are accepting these roles. Um, I mean, I can't blame, I can't blame Sydney Sweeney for something she said about Madden Webb. She said, I took that role because it got me an in with Sony so that I could do a different movie with them. I mean, that, and that's how things used to be too with Hollywood is you, you, you do the one bad movie because the bad movie needs star power. And then they throw you a bone down the road where you can make the movie you want to make. Yeah. Well, you even look at Adam Sandler during his contracts because you take, he hasn't had the best luck with Netflix, but you know, they're, especially with his last Spaceman one, the performance was fine, but the movie was horrible. But, you know, you're going to, everybody's going to have their bad movies when they're in the contracts. But the problem we have is going to be 
a lot of these budgets, and I'm going to go back a little bit to Jack and Jill with Adam Sandler, that cost $70 million to make to put uh, Adam Sandler dressed like a woman horribly. You take that $70 million, and I would be curious to see how much Al Pacino took to get that in that movie with that budget. But you take a lot of these things that look good on the poster, a lot of these marketing pieces with the intent to push people to this movie. And I would love to say that a lot of people on the back end, to your point, get to see some of that extra increase. But that's not Hollywood now, because most of the time when I'm looking up reviews and while doing my reviews to see the casting list, most of the time with these big budgets, they're people first, second, third job. And that's where we see a lot of the big issues here is, and then when you have a a movie that has a $300 million budget, say Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, which when you're banking on a singular character that everybody already loves, there's no reason to have $300 million as a budget unless you're paying $250 million to Harrison Ford to repraise his role. So a lot of these back-end people are getting kind of the scam, and these are the ones that matter. And when you have big budgets like that, you can guarantee there's going to be a lot of post-production uh, play on that script or pre-production play on reamping these stories in these script. And we get a lot of those studio meddling. So when we talk about Fall Guy, all that is to me is going to be a bigger budget version of Ghosted on Netflix that I know me and Josh looked at because that's what it reminded me while watching it, only with a better soundtrack. I love that you brought up the cast among other things because it it does feel like studios feel like they need to overload their their casts now instead of finding new young talent that could fill a role really well that doesn't need to be ryan reynolds just because he's available that day or chris evans or whoever they just overload it because like my go-to example of this is the Paw Patrol movie. Kids are not going to that movie because Kim Kardashian is, is in it. And ki- people, kids aren't going because Jimmy Kimmel's voicing a character in it. And they're like, they, they showcase like 15 names that are in these movies, especially the Paw Patrol movie. And I'm like, why do I care about any of these people being in the Paw Patrol movie when they're clearly not going to be the Paw Patrol? And it like, I get it's, it's a way for parents to be like, Oh, I, I'm, Kim Kardashian's and it maybe that adds some legitimacy legitimacy to it but like I just found out about this movie coming out called Spellbound which has been in development hell forever it's supposed to be out I think later this year uh on Netflix it was originally going to be an Apple Plus show or movie but they lost the uh distribution rights but like I saw a, an announcement for it I think and like Rachel Ziegler's in it N- Nicole Kidman's in it Javier Bardem is in it John Lithgow Nathan Lane uh, Jennifer Lewis and like they, they go on for like 15 people and I'm like that's Im- John Oliver's in this and I'm just like how much money did you just pay those people let alone the animators and the director for this movie and is this going to be a 200 million dollar animated movie which like I know that's a Pixar thing because they just go for a lot of photorealistic backgrounds and they detail everything like that's Pixar has like Nintendo polish but it's Pixar polish, I guess, but animated movies don't need this. And like, I know Robin Williams kind of gets the blame for kicking this whole trend off, but like you could go back to Charlotte's web. Debbie Reynolds didn't need to do an animated feature. And yet she did. And I mean, she's an amazing Charlotte. Robin Williams is an amazing genie. He's an amazing bat in uh, Fern Gully. You know, there's, there's an endless number of celebrities doing Burt Reynolds in all dogs go to heaven. Like you can go on and on and on. But like usually the, it's like that one stunt casting in an animated feature just to add like a legitimate parental intrigue to it. You're like, oh, Burt Reynolds is doing an animated movie. I got to go see it. I got to see what it's like. But now it's just like this is a live action cast in an animated movie. And how much of that budget are they eating up? And how much of that is affecting the story of these movies? And that that's another thing that we don't really have time to get into right now. But one thing that I'm just getting just sick over is how Hollywood is just completely disregarding animation as a storytelling device. It feels like every executive, including at Disney, they do not respect animation as storytelling anymore. It's not anything that they feel is worthwhile in terms of, I mean, Disney has won what probably 16 of the last 20 best animated features in the Oscars. Like that's something to hang your hat on, not something to be like, yeah, we know we're going to win. 
<clears throat> the only time they ever lose is when Studio Ghibli actually releases something, or, <laughs> you know, but like it just animation is su just such an amazing thing. And I had a talk with Slade from the Game Club Pod about the reason I'm shifting more towards watching anime and seeing some more anime stuff is because Western animation just never feels like it's taking a risk on anything. And it feels like it has nothing to say other than the occasional fart joke. I'm very interested in the wild robot, which I know is based off of a book that looks incredible. And like, yeah, it's got the celebrity cast that I, I hate, but just from a visual and narrative perspective, it looks like it has something to say. Like it's, it's probably going to be something about technology and nature coexisting or nature overtaking technology, blah, blah, blah. But if they can, you can tell the same story in a different and unique way. And yeah. that's where I think Hollywood is really falling flat right now. And I think that's part of where people are getting a little tired of making the effort to go to the theaters is because again, going to shit on borderlands <laughs> it's guardians of the galaxy, except they they're going to make a lot more piss jokes because they have that whole bog of piss that they're yeah. showcasing is like the big punchline of their, their trailers. So as we wrap this up, I have just one question that I'd like you guys to answer, but before that, because Joshua mentioned it, if cost $110 million, the voices of the animated imaginary friends, 23 of them, all celebrities, um, can either one of you tell me that you knew that Matthew Reese was in that movie? I don't even know if I know who Matthew Reese is. What about Brad Pitt? I did. Uh, Brad, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I know that guy. But no, did you know who, he was in the movie? I'm unfair no, but I, I, I saw the cast list. So yeah, he apparently is the invisible friend that they trip over Keith. So they did the Deadpool two joke again. Yeah, but like I mean Emily Blunt, like I understand that she is John Krasinski's wife, so she probably she probably just did the the job for free or for like pennies on the dollar. But you can't tell me that you couldn't have paid Tara Strong to do half of these <laughs> to do most of those voices for the yeah. same price that you got Emily Blunt. Yeah. Obviously, you're paying Steve Carell because he's the main one. But then you have Phoebe Waller-Bridge, Aquafina, George Clooney, Bradley Cooper, Matt, uh, Bill Hader, Matt Which, Damon. Which, Justin, I'm on your side. Aquafina is not a fucking voice actor. Thank you. Keegan-Michael Key, Blake Lively, Sebastian Maskowski, Christopher Maloney, Sam Rockwell, Maya Rudolph, Amy Schumer. Which, Brad again. Pitt, John Stewart. You can get Troy Baker. <laughs> you can get Christina V. You can get... Stephanie Shea, yeah. you can get Jennifer Hale, probably for pennies compared to what yeah. you paid these people to do all of those voices. Well, right. I think this is the pivotal moment. I'll use this as an example. Um, 2015, if another studio fails, studios follow and then they amplify their voice cast. There was an animated film, and I think it was a George Lucas studio, Strange Magic. Didn't have a huge voice cast, and that movie just taint yeah so um to me after 2015 that's when we started seeing a huge amplified just amplified voice casting start to really hit these kids movies we had some subtle things with early disney but it wasn't over bloated like we're seeing right now so i think with 2015 strange magic that one was the lesson that a lot of studios took away from if this was a george lucas project and he couldn't get this to be a success then this one is going to be a lesson learned for studios going forward. That is one thing that you can always bank on the studios to fail or take away the wrong lesson. Like I saw there's, there's a really funny comic from back in what would have been 2018 when black Panther came out where <laughs> it's a comic showing studio executives being like, okay, black Panther made a billion dollars. What is it about this movie that caused people to turn out to the box office? And the idea was cats. <laughs> and therefore uh, cats was green light so <laughs> the last question I, I have for you guys is we're heading on five years now of this and at this point it's it's a trend are you going to be sad if the theatrical experience as we know it is dead where it's where it becomes something like two three weeks to catch the movie otherwise then it's on streaming They'll do the um, they'll do the Broadway thing where yeah you'll probably have a matinee of like twenty bucks and then you know evening show of like thirty to fifty dollars, 
to catch the movie, but then it's just going to be on streaming. Most everything is, other than the big movies. The really big budget ones, $200 million, $300 million, they're going to have to put them in theaters to get to recoup money. I could see them maybe trying to do the Disney Plus thing, though, where they, they the premiere access, quote-unquote. I could see them trying to, to make that a thing again, where instead of having to go to the theater, you pay $15, $20, $30 for the next Marvel movie, and you can just watch it directly on streaming. Yeah, well, Or I'm you saying, can go to the theater. What I'm saying, is that going to bother you? Are you going to... Be sad. Oh, it'll bother. Yeah, it'll bother the hell out of me. If the AMC, if our AMC, it's we're down to one. You don't have an option anymore. You either have to see that one, or you have to drive like fifty minutes into Chicago. That's the future of our theaters. So I, I'm going to be a hopeful. I guess is going to be my uh, response to that. Is theaters can't die. Um, there's so much banking on them. What I think is going to happen, and there'll be a clause to this. It's going to open up some really good resets on mom and pop shops coming back up to stick to the basics. And even if that is to look as experiencing streaming things on streaming in on a big screen. So there, there will be a compromise to an extent. Um, will theater theaters stay in business? You know, that's eventually, hopefully they stay, but probably not. Um, but there will be a compromise at some point. And without theaters and studios and movies going back to basics where we take 5 million modest budgets, having a diverse set of movies hit theaters. It's a slow investment, but it's, if it flops, it's a not really a hit. You can lose more on a Marvel movie now than you will on a $5 million investment on it. And I think you can load a lot more theaters into it and that can bring back the experience and it will make way for a lot more, young actors to really get involved and encourage that the new generation of fans per se but for us to really save theaters it has to go back to that i always use the example of uh, monsters from 2010 i think a five hundred thousand dollar budget and i was floored that this budget was five hundred thousand because it looked professional it was a fantastic story and it had nobody really known in it and if you put that on the big screen i can guarantee you it wouldn't look like a five hundred thousand dollar movie and that movie made a small profit but it can be done but it's with filmmakers that are passionate about their project and driving this driving their movie and driving the vision it doesn't have to look like 300 million dollars as long as it tells a good story and it's engaging so something like that is where we have to get reset to but studios are so set on more money or go big and go home. That's the policy it seems in Hollywood right now. And if that continues, we will see some dangerous theater closings going into the future. Yeah, I, I think that's 100% accurate. And I think the, the best solution is, as Justin said, putting 10, 20, $30 million into a movie that could bring in 70 80 100 million dollars make a, a decent 30 40 million dollar 50 million dollar profit because you have to take into account advertising but you have they have to be willing to take risks and it seems like the only risk they're willing to take right now is on existing properties and sequels and that's the frustrating part too is that i think again i feel like we're a pretty fair representation of general audiences like yeah we're a little more invested into the goings on behind the scenes but we want new stuff. We want something we haven't seen before. And I think that's the thing that will get people back into the theater is new. Spider-Verse is an ex a perfect example. We have seen the Spider-Man story before, but we haven't seen Miles Morales story before. And we also haven't seen an animated feature told in this style before. We've seen similar things, but like there's definitely different kind of visual representations. Uh, there's comic book stuff that worked in there just lord and lord and miller seemingly horrible people to work for but they have a good creative style and that is something that while maybe the the way they treat their cast and crew or their at least their crew shouldn't be praised but that created the, that creativity should be shepherded and it should be encouraged in future generations will it happen i don't know because Hollywood is very much set in that worked. Let's do it 50 more times until people hate it. So I, I, I hope theaters don't die. Alex, to go back to your question that you had asked earlier, if we're down to one theater in the Rockford area, I, I, I will still be going. I I'm my kids beg me to take them to the theaters. I don't 
take them very often because I do want them to have a high standard for what they go to the theater for until they're a little older and they can see, be like, Oh, uh, this movie's coming out. Let's go see it. Oh, that was bad. <laughs> well, now we've learned our lesson. I like the theater. I just need to, I need a good experience. I need a good theater. Not this run down one patchy seats. People don't, you know, they don't care if people are talking during it, playing with their phones, all that stuff. I mean, I know I sound like an old man, you know, like turn off your phone and stop scrolling. And, and, you know, this, but, but at the same time, like there is that communal experience and it's, it's so good. Like I, one of the first times, cause I, I'm not really a person who goes and sees movies by themselves, but one of the first times I saw a movie by myself was I challenged myself and I went and saw the favorite in theaters. It was a weekday. It was a, like Tuesday, three thirty showing. And it was me, I was sat by myself and I was the youngest person there. And there was just a group of three or four older, like older women with this one guy there. And they were all kind of chit-chatting and something movie came on that looked like kind of scandalous or something like that. And they're like, Oh, you're going to love this, you know, to him. And I was enjoying watching them. And then some of the racy parts of the movie were happening. And I'm like, kind of like, peer, like I'm like one eyes on the screen and the other eyes on them. Like, are they going to walk out? Nah, they're staying. Okay. <laughs> I think I had a similar one with 80 for Brady because I thought I was going to be strategic and again, go see most of the movies by myself. I was like, all right, 80 for Brady, one o'clock show. It's a subtitle for the hearing impaired. Nobody's going to this movie. Pull up. Oh, the early yeah. bird special. <laughs> yep. You have a retirement home bus and going in, I'm like, <laughs> oh, hell no. But it's the same thing going in and it's a different experience, even though it's annoying, but it was adorable at the same time. It's not like teenagers vaping in the theater where anytime something funny happens, it's a, oh, that's funny. And you kind of laugh along with them commentating what's funny during the movie. So it kind of adds to that theater experience in a kind of a different level of annoyance, but adorable way. You guys have just reminded me when, when I went to go see Atonement, I actually went and saw that with my sister who was going through a breakup at the time. And I remember we got there late because my sister can never be on time for anything. We got there. We had to sit close to the front row in our theater. We were like the last two seats on the, the right hand side of the aisle. And there was a, a family with young children to go see atonement. And I don't know if they thought they were seeing a different movie or what was going on. I think maybe mom and dad had a date night planned and then the babysitter canceled on them. And instead of canceling the date night, they just brought the kids and then you got the scene in the library early on in the movie and then they booked it out of there. <laughs> and I was like, that was, that was really fun. But um, thinking back to the theater going experience and uh, recent movies, when I went and saw Furiosa, I was honestly getting a little annoyed. I didn't bring this up with Antonio because I was more interested in learning more about the backstory on everything, but I had to my, what would that be? Like two o'clock. I had a couple on a date and the boyfriend clearly was very invested in the Mad Max franchise. The girlfriend could not have cared less. And he had to explain everything in real time in the movie. So I ended up moving from my seat because I'm just like, shut the fuck up or move away from me. And I ended up just moving away from them because I'm, I'm not confrontational at a theater unless it's like asshole teens. Because like I remember I went and saw Avengers in 2012 uh, on my own to go just enjoy it one last time before it left theaters. And there was just a trio uh, or not. It, it was a group of teenagers who were like at the end of their summer vacation. And they were just like chatting it up, talking about going to a pool party. And I was like, Hey, can you fucking tell Tina to shut up? Because I can hear everything. And like I, I called them out by name because they would not shut up. And they ended up just leaving the theater. I'm like, thank you. If you're going to have this conversation in the middle of a theater that has at least a couple of other people, get the fuck out. Fucking Tina. She's the worst. That's why I fired her from my golf show. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, I think that kind of wraps up the conversation. We're, We're obviously not the ones to make a solution. We can offer our suggestions on things, which I feel like we have. And I, this is a good conversation, I think, to just kind of offer ourselves some catharsis because this it can be frustrating to go to the theater. It can be frustrating to hear about all the executives doing their executive speak. Like we, I alluded to a little bit about like the Pixar stuff and saying like, oh, we're going to focus more on broad, generalized stories and not not storytellers telling stories that people can relate to, even if it's marginalized experiences. Because you know who cares about that sort of shit? Like fuck off, Bob Iger. <laughs> 
but Justin, thanks so much for having been here tonight. Uh, it's been a great conversation. And I, I who else, who better to talk about the theater going experience than the guy who only just recently started going to the theater? Brand new to this. And I have to say, I was looking forward to this episode because I knew it was going to be very ther- therapeutic for me. <laughs> so thank you for allowing me to rant and something I can't do on my show because I have to be fair. <laughs> says you i mean you can be as fair (laughs) as you really want to be it's your show all right well justin please let everyone know again where they can find you on social media as well as your podcast yeah you can follow me anywhere on socials at movie wire show and you can listen to the movie wire anywhere you listen to podcasts you can also check out uh me and and chonio over at the cult worthy cinema podcast on back to the balcony over on youtube definitely like subscribe rate on all of those because it is weekly viewing and weekly listening on both the cult worthy back to the balcony and movie wire. Um, if for nothing else, just those sweet dulcet tones in your ears, like who doesn't want to have that great ASMR ASMR of Justin and Antonio talking. Uh, but Alex, please let us know who has done our remix for the, the theme music this week. I did. Oh man. Yeah. You're going to love this. Is it so we can cut, cut costs and help the investors? Oh yeah, that's the primary reason is I had to take it <laughs> under myself. So it's, you're gonna notice that there's it's not in tune. Um, I'm not even sure what strings I've used, but there was a vibra slap, so that's cool. <laughs> what was that mm-hmm. that they used to use on the old Star Trek? <laughs> what? But there, there's an actual instrument. What is that called? Like, I don't uh, remember. Oh man, you're letting me down, Alex. You're supposed to be the nerd that knows these things. I sometimes do. And by the way, Justin, <laughs> Al Pacino's rumored to have made $5 million from that, uh, from Jack and Jill, while uh, Adam Sandler pocketed 20 <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I don't know if that makes me satisfied or more angry. <laughs> well, you can join in on the conversation at our Discord. The link is in the episode description. You can also follow us on all the social media platforms at Talking Smack Pod, including Blue Skies, Instagram, threads hive social facebook youtube tiktok and lonnie's website also known as twitter you can email us your thoughts opinions reviews of anything you've seen uh, at tsmackpot at gmail.com thank you to leo allen for musical themes and beppo for original avatars retro Ale studios for our ricky avatar please like subscribe rate review on your podcatcher of choice and don't forget all you have to do is let us know if you would rather listen to this podcast or watch madam webb which i found out recently a co-worker would rather watch madam webb some people juggle geese, you know? But again, please like, subscribe, rate, review. Thank you so much for listening. Justin, thank you so much for being here. Alex, thank you so much. It's a Firefly reference, man. Get over it. Don't give oh, me okay. the tilted head, <laughs> tilted cat head nonsense. <laughs> thank you again, everyone, for listening. Take care, and we will see you next week. Watch Star Trek. What are you doing? What are you doing? No, what are you doing? What are you doing? No, what are you doing? What are you doing?